<laughs> How would our conception of the history of abolitionism, theology, and politics in antebellum America change if it centered the epistemological frameworks of free black women? This paper focuses on Mariah W. Stewart and Isabella Hardenberg, two free black women in antebellum Boston, Massachusetts, who understood themselves to be what Carlo Peterson has called doers of the word. Their spiritual calls transformed them into political advocates for African American liberation. This paper proceeds along three axes. First, it considers the relationship between blackness and space in antebellum Boston. It pauses that they created intra-political ideological spaces to resist the panoptic gaze of white northerners. Second, it situates 19th century black women's theology as ideolo ideologically aligned with what contemporary scholars call black feminist thought or womanist ethics. Finally, treating time as polytemporal, this paper grapples with the long afterlife of slavery for black citizens. Even when free antebellum black Americans were surveilled by the state and private white citizens, this surveillance was legalized through the Fugitive Slave Act and socialized through segregation in antebellum northern cities and the dismissal of people of color from categories of normative humanity in documents like town directories. Thus, this paper considers us ask us to consider the tenuous nature of freedom for the black body. In the antebellum United States, freedom was precarious for African American people. Laws like the Fugitive Slave Act, 1793 and 1850, criminalized black freedom by rewarding white citizens for seizing black fugitives from labor, taking them before judges, and returning them to the state from which they fled. The law both legalized and socialized the treatment of the free black body as the criminal body. Free black life in antebellum Boston was defined by the ongoing legacy, legacy of the Middle Passage. Because of the rupture caused by the Middle Passage, Carla Peterson argues that for 19th century African Americans, local space was double. Local space was the space in Africa before the Middle Passage from which black bodies were kidnapped, but did not want to return except through their imaginations. Local space was also their place in the United States, where they lived under surveillance and discipline. To Peterson's double local space, I add a third. We must understand local space as physical, mental, and psychic or spiritual. Black Bostonians created an imagined community among themselves, which constitutes what post-colonial scholar Edward Said calls a rival geography. We might envision the rival geography that free black citizens created in Boston as both physical and ideological. The ideological space they created was what cultural, cultural anthropologist James Scott has called infra-political. While dominant 19th century historiographies often treat black citizens as passive receivers of freedom from benevolent white northerners, an infra-political reading of black resistance elucidates the complex negotiations of race and space in antebellum Boston. Because most African Americans living in antebellum Boston were direct <coughs> descendants of enslaved persons, we must understand slavery as the phenomenon that shaped all subsequent relationships that women of African descent had with one another, their families, and their society. Because of the conditions under which black women's epistemologies developed in the United States, the intellect of black women in antebellum Boston was necessarily black feminist. Similarly, they possessed womanist theological consciousnesses in that they were traditionally capable, audacious, and willful. Black feminist and womanist epistemologies emerge readily in any serious interrogation of the lived experiences and intellectual productions of Mariah W. Stewart and Isabella Hardenberg. Stewart was born to a free family in Hartford, Connecticut in 1803. At a young age, she was orphaned and was sent to work for a clergyman's family, where she says that the seeds of piety and virtue were instilled in her, but her soul thirsted for knowledge. She married James W. Stewart, a mulatto shipping agent, in 1826 and was left a widow in 1829. She articulates her conversion to Christianity as the change that led her to devote her life to the cause of God and her brethren. In 1830, she began what Marilyn Richardson is called a secular ministry of political and religious witness as a vocal opponent of not only slavery, but also political and economic exploitation. For Stewart, the cause of abolition was a divine imperative. Similarly, Hardenberg understood freedom to be a divine right. In 1826, the New York enslaved woman carried a knapsack with provisions, meager clothing, and shoes in her nursing baby, and seized her freedom openly and defiantly. This act grounded her future political activism as she defied her owner's contention that she was his property on moral grounds. Upon becoming free, Hardenberg joined the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, the Church of the Black Working Class at the time, and a center for political discourse. 
Her most profound ontological shift happened in 1843 when she decided to follow the voice of God that led her away from New York. On June 1st, 1843, the morning of Pentecost Sunday, she felt fortified, believing that she, just as much as any man, could be filled with the Holy Spirit. She took on a new identity, no longer Isabella, she was now Sojourner Truth. Her abolitionist policies intimately intertwined with her call from God, and she began her journey north to Massachusetts. The captivity experiences of black women in 19th century America echo in our present moment. Scholars like Sadia Hartman and Lisa Lowe have wrestled against the archival limitations by, by rearranging the basic elements of the story to tell what might have been. Hartman calls this practice critical fabulation, while Lowe calls it past conditional temporality. They point to the necessity that we understand the story of black women's captivity as intimately interwoven with our present and our future. As we read through the historical record of the lives of Mariah, Isabella, and their contemporaries, we must situate them in the time and place in which they lived and labored, but we also must understand that the way we make sense of them has profound repercussions for how we understand the lives of black women today. Perhaps we can, as C. Riley Snorton suggests, consider race and gender as they co-constitute each other in the context of Western modernity as a history of theory that functions to express what is unthinkable across complex temporalities. So race and gender allow us to think through history doubly and to understand that the past is not contained in the past. The past constructs the ongoing grammar that is being used to criminalize the black female body well into the 21st century. The historical lives of Marina W. Stewart, Isabella Hardenberg, and their contemporaries point to the need for collaborative efforts among black and brown women to produce the conditions for our freedom. Black feminist thought does not neglect the fact that not all African American women are oppressed in the same ways, nor does it assert that some black women do not oppress other black women. However, it does posit that black feminist thought is a critical social theory because of its commitment to justice. That commitment to justice is not just for black women alone, rather black feminist thought is capacious in its ability to liberate all oppressed people. The battle for women of color's freedom happens along four primary axes that are anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-homophobia, and anti-classism. As the women of the Combahee River Collective statement elucidated, major systems of oppression are interlocking. Historically, United States black feminist activists have actively resisted those systems at every turn. Thank you.